Let's stand as we read these verses today. I want to tell you, this is power packed. These verses that I'm going to read to you out of Romans chapter 8, verses 1, beginning. They say that if, if, Rome, if, uh, if the Bible is, was a ring, this would be the diamond. You hear that? If the Bible was a, a ring, this is, would be the diamond. One, one scholar said, if, 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 uh, if the Bible is a mountain peak, this is the Mount Everest. Powerful verse today. The title of the message is Deliverance from Sin's Penalty, but also Sin's Power. Deliverance from Sin's Penalty and Power. You know, that's our problem in our world today. I don't know about you. That was my problem. But I think you know too. Listen to these verses. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, it could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, on account of sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? Here it is, verse 4, that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God nor indeed can be so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God but you you believer you are not in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you now if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ he is not his and if Christ is in you the body is dead because of sin but the spirit is life because of righteousness but if the Spirit, there's a prophecy, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit that dwells in you. We may go in the grave, we're coming out. Amen? Amen. Deliverance from sin's penalty and power. Father, today we ask for the precious anointing of the Holy Spirit. In and of ourselves we can do nothing, we have nothing to offer, but by your Spirit... We, are, we have the ability to do what you desire to do today. Anoint the minds and hearts of your people. Give grace. Do whatever you desire to do today. Let thy will be done in this. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I want you to be seated today. Deliverance from sin's penalty and from sin's power. I want you to see three things out of this text today. I have a lot of ground to cover, so I want to move quite fast today. I want you to see three ideas that the Lord has here for us. First of all, we're going to see a glorious declaration in this passage, the most, one of the most glorious, if not the most glorious. Then we're going to have a description, and then we're going to look at a difference that the gospel makes in each of our lives. What Paul is saying in this text here is this, is that we, human beings, can experience freedom from sin's penalty, and from sin's power. We can be free. Do you hear that? We can be free. This truth is found, you may not pick it up, but it's found in other passages that we quote, that we often quote, like, like this verse, 1 John 1 and 9. You know this verse. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to what? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What do we see? We see forgiveness from the penalty, but we see freedom from the power. What is that? Forgiveness has to do with sin's penalty in that verse. Cleansing has to do with sin's power. Here's the message today. Here's, the, here's what we want to drive home to us today at Trinity Life Church, and that's this. God wants each of us to experience freedom from the deadly, horrible penalty of sin but he also wants us to be delivered every day from its dominating power. I'm telling you today, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You can be free today. Now hear this. 
No matter who you are, no matter what you're in, no matter what title's on it, no matter what power's over someone's life, we can be free because Jesus is more powerful. I mean, no, Jesus can set the captives free this morning. We offer a gospel of hope. Do you realize no one is hopeless? Come on, no one is outside of God's grace. No one is outside of God's mercy. Why? Because we offer a gospel of hope. This book is a book of hope to the hopeless today. And I, I thought about this, and this just came to my mind this week. Do you realize a lot of the old hymn writers understood this, this principle of not just being forgiven of sins? See, God not, only, God not just doesn't simply want to forgive us of our sins. He wants to do something so glorious in us that we're free from sin, that we walk in victory over sin. The, the old hymn writers wrote about this in, in their theology. Now, pick these words up. I quoted part of this Wednesday night. And by the way, we do have service here Wednesday night. Your church is open. Come on, amen. Listen to the amen. Thank you, sister. I heard that. Listen to this. This is the old song, Rock of Ages. Pick up the theology. Freedom from the penalty, forgiveness, and the power. Look at this. Notice this. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed be of sin, notice this, be of sin the double cure. Everyone say the double cure. The double cure. What's, what's the hymn writer saying? The hymn writer saying exactly what Paul said in Romans 8, exactly what John said in 1 John 1 and 9. The double cure is this, save from wrath and make me pure. Thank God for forgiveness, but thank God for the power that sets us free. Here's what the beginning of Romans says. Romans 1.16 for the gospel is what? The power of God unto salvation. That's deliverance. The power is deli de deliverance from all who believe, the Jew first, then the Greek. And then it says, for in it, the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. Do you see how this is interlaced in the scripture, in our theology, in our songbook? God today wants you and I to realize there's a double cure. There's a double cure for our life. There's forgiveness, there's mercy, but there's also the power of the whole, through the Holy Spirit, through the work of redemption, that you and I can live for God. Do you hear that? We can live for God. There's a power to live for God. I want to talk about this today. So let's look at this. So let's look at the spiritual realities found in this glorious passage. First of all, I want us to look at the declaration of freedom that Paul, through the Spirit of God, gives here. Here it is. This has to be one of the greatest truths in all of the Word of God. And it simply is this. There is therefore now, right now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Those are probably the greatest words that a human being could ever hear. No condemnation. Say that with me. No condemnation. Now, if you have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you have been converted, i.e. what Jesus said, born again, these words apply to you. Over your life, something glorious has happened, and there is this declaration from God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, no condemnation. That ought to change that ought to change everything about the way we live, the way we look at life, the way we relate to God. There is no condemnation right now over each of our lives. Hallelujah to God. Now, now this, there's a great confusion over this also, this, this thought of no condemnation. Because the misunderstanding is many modern people, and I won't even say the camp that it comes out of, but many modern believers think this means no more conviction of sin for believers. Did you hear what I said? There's many, you, you, I hear it from pulpits. I hear it from pulpits. I hear it when I listen to sermons on TV. I hear this kind of theology. This does not mean no more con conviction of sin for believers. How many of you know that positionally, when you're saved, we, we, we get accounted the, the righteousness of Christ. It's imputed to us. And at that moment, we are, we are freed and we are just before God. It's called justification. At that moment, God looks at you differently. Why? Because what Jesus did is, gives, is, accountable, is accounted to your account. That's a great thing, isn't it? That's a positional truth. But let's, let's take our halos off this morning. Come on. Some of your halos are tipping a little right now. But 
the truth is, positional truth and practical truth are not always the same. You, you understand? What, let me explain myself. What I mean is, is in this great work of redemption, when we're saved, God takes away the judgment because it was put on Jesus. But practically, we still have issues. Some of you have more issues than others, but we still have issues. And what that's called is sanctification. So in other words, God saves us, and he gives us perfect righteousness that is the righteousness of Jesus. And then throughout our lives, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we grow in the grace of God. We become more like the Lord, and that's the work of God. He works in us to do his will and his good pleasure in us. And by the way, that's a lifelong process. There is a denomination that believes that there's an experience that you can be sinlessly perfect in this life. But the problem is, I heard of a guy one time that believed that, but then someone made him mad and he lost his temper. So we're not all that we used to be, but we're sure not all that we're going to be. Come on. He's still working in me. He's working in you. Thank God. He's not going to give up on us. But think about these words. This doesn't mean no more conviction of sin for the Christian. Thank God for the work of the Holy Spirit. When we stump our toe, when we do something that's, that violates his command, when we sin as Christians, thank God the Holy Spirit is there and he gets us back to the cross. He brings us back to 1 John 1 and 9. He brings the believer to a place of repentance. That's that work of sanctification. It doesn't mean no more conviction for Christians. What it means is that the child of God is not under slavery towards sin. He's not condemned. He's not under penal servitude. Now think about this. We live in a divided world today. Do you know that? More than ever before, we live in a divided world. But see, I'm talking about a different division than you're talking about. I mean, in our nation, there's racial divisions. Very sad. In our nation, there's economic divisions. Class divisions. But those are not the divisions that I even care about. Those are not divisions that I even, that I even give myself to. Because we're children of God. And there's only two categories in the world today. There's two categories. There's those that are in Christ and there's those outside of Christ. Did you hear what I just said? There's only two categories. Paul saw the world. He said in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Two categories. Those that are saved, those that are lost. Those that are in Christ, those that are not in Christ. Now think about this. The only thing that's going to unite this world is what we're doing here this morning. It's the only thing. Any kind of fleshly, carnal, worldly wisdom will not unite us. But what unites us is Jesus Christ. Everybody say Jesus Christ. Hear this, hear this, that Jesus unites us in the most beautiful, the most glorious unity that you could ever imagine. It's amazing. Now think about across this room right now. In the natural, there's division in this room. There's color divisions. There's maybe economic divisions. There's educational divisions. All kind of divisions in this room in the natural. But you know what? In the spirit, there is no division among us. Do you know why? Because of the moment. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter if you have a million dollars in the bank or two nickels in the bank. It doesn't matter what nationality you are. When a person comes to Jesus Christ, we're made one. We're made the body of Christ. No one can create unity. It's created at salvation. The Bible says maintain the unity of the peace. Why does it say maintain it? Because you can't create it. Only God can create it. And at the moment someone comes to Jesus Christ, you become a part of the body. And guess what? We're one family. Everybody say one family. We're one family. We're one in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, and Jesus Christ is our great Lord. That ought to make us want to shout. But Paul said, I don't see anyone in the flesh anymore. He said, I see people as in Christ. Paul even says in that text, he says, we even thought of Christ this way after the flesh. We looked at a natural realm. But that we, we're the church. We have spiritual glasses. And what, how do we see the world? We see the world as two categories. The world is divided. And God looks down at the world. He says, there's those that are saved and those that are lost. Those that are in Christ and those that are not in Christ. So think about this. The declaration is this. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. But, but I want you to consider this right here. There is, there is condemnation 
to every single person on our planet today that is outside of Jesus Christ, that have rejected his gospel. They are not enjoying the freedom of forgiveness. They're not enjoying the, the freedom of the power of broken sin through the power of God, through his gospel. They are under condemnation. Those outside, now think about this, those outside of Christ right now are under God's wrath. They're under God's judgment. Now, think about this. If we believe this Bible, this is, I'm telling you the truth today. This is, what, this is the reality of human beings today that do not know Jesus Christ. We need to understand this. They're under God's holy wrath. It, the full judgment has not been meted yet. It will be meted in eternity. But they are right now, the scripture says, he that believes in the Son has everlasting life. Right now, no condemnation. But the verse says, he who does not have the Son, does not believe on the Son, shall not see life. Notice the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus, but the wrath of God abides on him. Just this week, I was reading a man in our state, one of our state prisons here in Texas. Think about it. He is on death row for a horrible crime he committed. The sentence is the death chamber, lethal injection. Just this week, the Supreme Court heard an appeal. And that man in our, in, our, in our prison system on death row, that man received from the Supreme Court of the United States a stay of execution. Now, that was a mercy. That was a mercy. And the reason for it was, it's really irrelevant, but I'll tell you, he was, he was wanting his spiritual advisor, he's a Buddhist, he wanted his spiritual advisor to be in the chamber with him when he was receiving the lethal injection. The Supreme Court looked at the case and said, we're going to look at it, and now you have a stay of execution. Now listen, that was a mercy. The judgment is still there. That man is still going to the death chamber. That man's not going to get out of this sentence. He killed a police officer. They're going to place that needle in his arm, and they're going to kill that man. He's going to die for his crime, but he got a stay of execution. That's a mercy. Judgment will still be meted out. Do you realize? Think about this. Every lost person has a, a death sentence hanging over them, an eternal death sentence. But they, but they receive mercy every day, every single day, every single day, every breath that they get to breathe again. It's God's mercy. Every Sunday that goes by when churches are open and the gospel is being preached and God says, I love you, be saved, I have a plan for you, I'll take away the condemnation. See, that man on our state prison death row, he, his sentence won't be taken away. But I'm going to tell you, I don't, no matter where a person has been, no matter how long they've been in sin, that judgment can be taken away. At the moment someone says yes and surrenders to God, they go from condemnation, come on, to no condemnation. It can happen today. It can happen to you here. It can happen to those watching on the internet. No condemnation only to those who know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Every day we get the mercy. But, but if a person rejects Christ all their days and dies rejecting Christ, one day the scripture tells us what will happen. It's very clear. In the Revelation, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, and whose face the earth and heavens fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw, notice, the dead and the small stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. By the things which were written down in the books, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell or Hades, which is called the place of the part of dead. Actually, a better translation than hell in the old King James. Hades is better. Because hell is eternal judgment. It, hell is a lake of fire. Hades is the time between the, the, before the last judgment. It's Hades, the place of the part of dead. Delivered up the dead which are in them, and they were judged, and each according to his works. Notice, the de uh, then death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. That's hell. That's Gehenna. The second death, for eternal death, second death. Notice this. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. It should break our hearts. 
It should cause tears to flow down our cheeks. It should cause us to intercede for the lost, to know that people that are under condemnation today, that, that, they, if, that, that they, if they reject Jesus, this is what's going to happen to them. And in eternity, they're going to say, is my name in that book? Is my name in that book? And the, and the Lord is going to say, you rejected my son. You rejected my plan. You rejected my love. You rejected my mercy. You rejected the Holy Spirit. You rejected the church. You rejected the word of God. You rejected the pleading of the minister. You rejected, and your name is not there because you rejected. Condemnation will remain there unless a person repents and gets saved. So here's what I would say to you just as a practical preaching thing. And that's this. That in preaching, in preaching the gospel, we must show the sinner his condition before God. It is no use in telling someone God loves you. Well, that goes without saying, of course God loves us. Of course God loves every human being. That goes without saying. But God's love on its own won't save you. It takes the shed blood of Jesus Christ from the cross to save you. God, just because God loves everyone, see, we don't believe in universalism, church. We don't believe everyone's going to be saved. We believe only those who receive the Son of God, Jesus Christ, into their hearts and into their lives. They must receive Christ. I think this is a great error where many seeker-sensitive churches preach and it's just a strange deal. They don't lift up the cross. They don't share the demands of the cross. But notice this. We need to show us the sinner his condition before God. Peter's sermon was very clear. Peter's sermon cut to the heart of the matter. Remember Peter's sermon on Pentecost? We referenced it last week, I think, or week before. This is Peter's sermon. It's going to give you a little excerpt of his sermon in Acts. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made Jesus. Notice this. He's looking at these people. And he says to them, God has made, God, surely he has made this Jesus. And he looks at them and said, whom you crucified. He said, you crucified him. Who's both Lord and Christ. You killed God. You killed the son of God. Now, when they heard this, notice they were cut to the heart. The sermon cut them to the heart. And then they said, what do we do down in verse 40? What, what do we do? Or verse uh, 38, what do we do? Or verse 37, what do we do? And he tells them what to do. And then, th then it says you need to say, be saved from this crooked generation. So, so here, here is this. In, the, in Peter's message, it, they were cut to the heart. I fear today that we don't have enough message that cut to the heart. We don't have messages that, that deal with sin and messages that, that show people where they are before God and it moves them toward the cross and it moves them toward God and it moves them away from sin. My fear is that we have too many sermons that coddle people and too many sermons that, too many sermons that leave them in sin and don't change anyone. Peter's sermon changed people. We ought to preach a gospel that changes people. So my, I would say to you that we must preach hell. We must preach hell. Why? Because the word of God says in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some may count slackness, but is long-suffering. Listen, not willing that any should, say it, perish, but all should come to repentance. That's the heart of God. Notice Notice John 3, 16. We miss a part of it. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. Now, the words of Christ, the words of your Savior, Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear, words of Jesus, do not fear him who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You realize with that sermon, Jesus would not be allowed to preach in many churches across our nation. But if we are not preaching the very words of Jesus, are we his sermons or are we his servants? Jesus preached a shocking sermon one time. He, warned, he loved people. He warned them that what what condemnation meant and what no condemnation meant. Jesus one day said this. He preached a sermon in, in Luke 16. He said this. There was a rich man and there was a beggar man named Lazarus. 
And the rich man had everything he wanted. Everything. He lived in extreme luxury. The beggar man sat outside his gate, just even desired crumbs from a table. There was no compassion that this man had on him. So the dogs came and licked his sores. This rich man so consumed in his narcissistic life that he didn't even recognize a man starving to death right outside of his gate. But Jesus said, both those men died. But there's, listen, there's a difference between no condemnation and condemnation. The rich man had everything he wanted. But except he didn't have the right thing. He was, poor and he was poor in godly things. There was a beggar man. Apparently, he knew God and trusted God. And even in his suffering and poverty, he didn't turn his heart away from God. But he believed in God. And at the moment of death, at the moment of death, Sister Helen, when, Reuben, when, sister, when brother Reuben, your brother, the moment he died, he went into the presence of the Lord because he loved the Lord. He loved the Lord. The Bible says this, the angels came and took that poor beggar man, Lazarus, took him into heaven, Abraham's bosom, it's called. Another place it's called paradise. Paul called it paradise. And it's where the righteous went before, we believe, before the cross. They went to Abraham's bosom. They went to Hades, but it wasn't the suffering side of Hades. It was Abraham's bosom. It was a place of comfort. It was a place of paradise. And that beggar man had a hard life. But then the angels came and gave him an escort to heaven. But the Bible said, then the rich man, this is, this is Jesus' sermon. I'm just reiterating the sermon. Jesus said, the rich man died and in hell. In hell. He lifted up his eyes, being in plural, torments. Torments. And somehow he saw across the chasm, he could see Lazarus. And he said, saw Abraham and said, Abraham, send Lazarus that he may just touch my tongue with a little water for I'm tormented in these flames. And what did Jesus say? And what did Abraham say in the sermon that Jesus gave? Uh, Lazarus, in your, or a rich man, in your lifetime, you receive good things. Lazarus received evil things. Now he is comforted and you are tormented. And he said, no, 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 Father Abraham, I have five brothers. I don't want them to come into this place. Isn't it, ama isn't it amazing? People in this world are tied up and tangled up in every kind of worldly activity. But in hell, the greatest prayer meeting in the, in, the, in the universe today, the greatest prayer meeting that's going on today is not in a church, but it's in hell. And in hell, people that have rejected Jesus Christ are crying out, don't come here, don't come here, don't come here. The most wicked people that have ever faced uh, the grace this earth are people today that are saying, don't come to this place. Don't come to this place. And that's what that rich man was doing. I don't want them to come here. And Abraham said, they have the word of God. They have the word of God. And then the rich man said, no, if someone rose from the dead, they would believe. And Abraham said, no, they have the word of God. Well, I'm going to tell you, someone did rise from the dead. And people still don't believe. Jesus rose from the dead. And people still don't believe. With all the evidence that we have, we need to show the sinner his condition before God. Now, I took a little more time on that than I wanted to. But I wanted you to see that no condemnation. Let's look at that now. Condemnation means that people are under God's wrath. And if they die in that state, they'll die lost. But they don't have to. But let, let's say this. Let's, let's change gears here. So if, if there are people that are under condemnation that are outside of Christ, but what about us? What about us? What about every human being that has said yes to Jesus and are truly born again? They're truly converted, truly saved. What does that mean? That, that means at, at that moment there's no condemnation. Everybody say no condemnation. Now, let's look at this. Here's what happens. And let's just ask, ask it with a question. What happens the moment that a person believes upon Christ? What happens at that moment? Most Christians don't really realize the magnitude 
of the spiritual transaction and the miracle of salvation that takes place the moment we go from condemnation to no condemnation. I'm going to list a few of these for you. First of all, one of the things that happens is we go from spiritual death to spiritual life. Paul said this. Paul said in Ephesians, You who were once dead in trespasses and sins, Christ has made you alive. Do you know at that moment that a person is saved, they go from death to life as it has to do with God. Come on, amen? Here's another thing that happens. At the moment we go from no condemnation to no condemnation, at that moment we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that every Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Now, we, we teach that there's an endowment of power called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I'm talking about salvation. At the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit comes to indwell each of our lives. What else happens? What else happens is this. At the moment of salvation, no condemnation, when that declaration is given over your life, you're taken out of old Adam's doomed race, and you're brought into Christ's redeemed race. The Bible says all things become new. The old has passed away. All things have become new. We become part of, of a new group of people. And, and also, the past is gone. Old things are passed away. Some of you say, amen. I'm glad to hear that, Pastor. Amen. You've had a pretty rough past. Well, the fact is, everyone's had a rough past. Why? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I, watched, I saw a picture this morning, and I thought, you, you watch the, the college scandal that's going on? You know, the college scandal, the lady, the, the lady from the TV show that, that did the, did the uh, paid $500,000 to get her kids in college. There's like 50 rich people that did all this stuff. And I saw a picture of that lady this morning. And her and her husband were sitting there, and some goofy paparazzi took a picture of these two people. And the husband was sitting here, the lady was sitting here, and they were looking. And I, and I looked at her face, and I saw so much stress. And I thought, I can't even imagine what that lady's going through. I can't even imagine. She's probably saying, I am so stupid. Why did I do this? And you know what I'm going to tell you? I listen to the news, and I watch all these people jump on the bandwagon. Isn't it amazing how people jump on the bandwagon? Everybody jumps on the bandwagon. But let me ask you a question today. What if every sin you've ever committed, what if every evil thought, every secret evil thing you've ever done, what if we put it on the screen today? Could we all do that? Would anybody, take a, would anybody go for that today? Anybody volunteer for that today? Everything we've ever done, any wicked thing we've done, things that people know, pe things that people don't know, would you love to put that on the screen today and say, let's play it all for everyone to see? Every, er, yeah, amen. <laughs> come on, come on. All of our halos just went, ah. <laughs> Some of your halos just went, Psh! it just fell off on the floor. You know what? The easiest thing in the world to look at that lady and go, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? How do you know that if you didn't have that kind of money, you wouldn't have done that? You'd have done worse than that. I would have done worse than that. But aren't you glad today that the moment we come to a saving grace of God, the old has gone. My sins are gone. The old person is gone. It's that old person is dead. That old person that I used to be is down in the grave with Jesus. All those sins that we committed are down in the grave. They're under the blood, never to be remembered anymore. And we're brand new in Jesus Christ. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. Your past is gone. Your future's bright. Glory to God. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Here's another thing that happens. Satan's power is broken over your life, and his right over your life is completely broken forever. Satan has no right to your life and my life. Paul said in his sermon in Acts 26, about verse 18, he said that we ta God takes us from the, from, the, from the power of Satan to the power of God. Satan has no right over you. He has no power over you. Here's another great thing that happens at the moment when you're declared justified, and that's this. He writes your name down in heaven. Do you know your name's in heaven? Jason Lewis, you're in heaven. Amen? Josh and James, the twinnings. <laughs> names written down. Brother Richard, your name's written down in heaven. 
Come on, we're registered in heaven. That's the Lamb's book of life. What is that book? The most important book in the universe because it's the book that's going to determine eternity, where we spend eternity with God or away from God. The moment a person's saved, it says that our names are registered. Our names are indicates that it's registered in heaven. Our names are in the book of life. How does that happen? Not by good deeds. You can never work your way to heaven, not by giving, not by church attendance, not by trying to be better than other people. Only one thing, believing upon Christ. Whosoever, uh, by grace you've been saved. Come on. By grace you've been saved. Glory to God. And then at that moment, when God declares no condemnation over you, you, be, you you're baptized. Now, you may not feel it because it's not water baptism, but spiritual baptism takes place, and you're baptized into the body of Christ, and you become part of God's family. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 said, we've all been made to drink of one spirit. We've all been baptized into one body. And, and in heaven, at that moment, you're saved. And God says, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. At that very moment, you have an incredible, glorious in heaven, uh, inheritance in heaven that's reserved for you and me. And the enemy can't take it away. The world can't take it away. It is safe in God's deposit in heaven. And oh, I can't wait to get there. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. What, a, what an incredible declaration that's over our lives today. No condemnation. No judgment for us. None. Why? Because our precious Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago hung there between heaven and earth, of which we're going to portray on Good Friday, six hours. He hung there. He took our punishment. He took our judgment. And now he says we can go free. Marvelous love. Wonderful Jesus. Amen. Thank God for forgiveness today. Thank God for free, the freedom of forgiveness, the free mercies of God, so wonderful, so great. Listen, you don't have to leave this place today with condemnation over your life. You don't have to leave under the power of anything except the power of the grace of God's love. Amen? God said, I want you to be free. He, he, said, he came to set us free from these things. So many Christians. Now listen, now let's, let me... Let me give this last little part. We won't get to all this. I'll tell you what I won't do. I'll tell you what I do. I won't preach any longer than Reese did when I let him preach that Sunday. <laughs> Pastor, I preached over an hour, he said. I said, you did? Well, hey, I get, don't I get an hour and a half as a senior pastor? Come on. No, we'll, let, we'll land this just in a second here, okay? Now listen. We'll get to two parts of this. We may come back Wednesday. This declaration of freedom. But then there's this description. I want to close with this description. That's all we have time for. There's a, there's a description from verse 2, 2 to 4. And it mentions some things that you need to know what they are. It mentions the law of sin and death. Well, what's that mean, the law of sin and death? It mentions the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It mentions God sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And then it mentions in verse 4 that righteous requirements of the law may be fulfilled in us. Well, wait a second, Pastor. I thought we weren't under law anymore. Be careful with the law. Somebody that tells you we're not under the law anymore, ask them what they mean. Because the law means more than one thing in the Scripture. The law means the civil law of Israel. The law means the, the religious laws. But there's a moral law that's eternal. So you better be careful. Here it says you're going to be able to keep those. So, so think about this. The law of sin and death is this. The law of sin and death is the power of sin that dominates the human life and drives the human life. One of the most powerful forces in the world, we may call it the second most powerful force in the world, is the law of sin and death. It's the power of sin that dominates a person's life. There are people today, maybe in this room, and there's things that you cannot stop doing. People in our city today are under the power of sin, and they, they say, why do I do what I do? Why can I stop these things? Because they are under the power of the law of sin and death, and it drives people, and a human being cannot be free on their own. You cannot get free from sin on your own. All religion does is make a person a hypocrite. 
because a person is pretending on the outside. That's what the Pharisees did. Religion can make us pretenders. But only the gospel can change the heart and give us true righteousness on the inside. Man starts on the outside. God said, no, no, I'm going to start on the inside. And the law of sin and death is that power, that propensity, that power of sin that drives human beings. Now, there's a law of gravity. It works. Just climb up top of this building and jump off. See if it works. It's going to work. But you know what? I, I saw these guys that have these jet packs like over in Dubai, and they fly through the air in these jet packs. I'd really like to do that. That'd be cool. My wife's watching now, so I better not. You know, she may say, you ain't doing that. Or maybe she'd say, yeah, you need to do that. But anyway, so you can override the law of gravity with the law of propulsion, force, right? A greater force. You can, you can get in a plane when we flew to India, when we flew to Israel, the, the law of gravity, listen, the law of gravity didn't stop going to Israel. When we flew to Israel, we flew to Frankfurt, Germany, flew into Tel Aviv. The law of gravity didn't stop for that airplane, but that airplane had jet propulsion on it. It had the power to, to overcome the law of gravity, and we were good. You know, we were drinking our coffee and eating our food and just fellowshipping and listening to music. We weren't even worried about the law of gravity. Why? We were under the force of another. Are you getting me here? Are you getting where I'm going? There's a force of sin that you cannot overcome on your own. It, it will drive you. It'll destroy you. It'll drive you into hell itself. But there is one power in the universe. Look at, look at, verse, look at verse 2. The law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I can tell you this. You may be in a prison house. Sin may have you captive today. But I can tell you this. There's somebody that has your key to your freedom. And he has the power that you can be free and you can stay free. Why? But through the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, there's a greater power than sin. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you. I'm excited about that today. You can be free 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 because of the power of Jesus Christ. You see, did you get the illustration? I just came up with that. That's not even in my notes. But I had to be God because I'm not that smart. There's a, there's a power that's greater than gravity. There's a power that's greater than sin. It's the power of Jesus Christ. He can break pornography. He can drink. This young man was on drugs. This young man was on drugs. Stand up here. Come here, Reese. Make me look good. <laughs> Actually, make me look bad. This young man was on drugs. This young man was a basketball player in college. But drugs, there was a power that was driving his life. Sin was dominating his life. And years ago now, he stepped in my office on a Saturday we spent two hours together, and I can tell you what I did. Nothing. I did nothing. I can do nothing. I'm a frail human being, but I can tell you this. Jesus was in that room with us. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And this young man left that room different than he came in. He came in bound on drugs. He left a child of God. He left an anointed preacher of God. He left called of God. And he's been preaching the gospel ever since. Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's stand. Let's stand today. There's a power. Come on. Oh. Come on, lift your hands. Begin to worship him. Come on, come on. Begin to worship him today. Begin to thank him for the gospel. Begin to thank him for the grace of God. Begin to thank him for the mercies of God. Begin to thank him for what he's done in your life. You are free. You are free. You are free. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, the law of the Spirit of life is the work of the Holy Spirit. That's what that is. Oh, let's just begin to sing a moment and then we'll, we'll have a prayer. Come on, let's begin to sing. And oh, and all to him I owe. Sin has left crimson stain 
He washes white as snow, and Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin has left the crimson stain. He washes white as snow. Come on, just play it. worship you Jesus come on just praise him come on just praise him right now come on worship him right now the Lord is here to give us his help to give us his strength today oh Jesus paid it all sing it and Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin has left Ramson stain, he was. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Sing it out as a prayer. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin has left. Crimson stain, he washed Once again, Jesus paid it all. And Jesus paid it all. And all to him I owe. Sin has left. Crimson stain, he I want to give an altar call right now. And I'm just, we're going to sing this again. A very simple but beautiful song. I think sometimes moving out from where we are and acknowledging it almost like it stirs faith in us. I want you to know you're among family today. There's no judgment here. We've all had struggles in our life and we still have struggles in our life. Do you know we need God's grace every we need the law of the Spirit of Christ, a life in Christ Jesus every day. If you have a struggle in your life. Or maybe you just need some strength in your life. If you've got a mountain you can't overcome. I remember when I was a young man, about six months after I got saved, I just was in some bondage, and I couldn't get free. I couldn't get free. And you know what? Actually, I let the enemy get back hold of me a little bit. And I just was under. I felt so low. Oh, I felt so low. And I remember driving home one night. It was January. Driving home. It was very cold outside. You could see your breath when you talked. And I drove in my driveway from church, and I was almost in despair. I was almost in despair. And I didn't even go inside. It was dark, about 9.30 at night, and I walked down the side of our house where the old basketball goal was there, through the back fence, through the backyard, out the back back fence where a big, huge field was, and I just walked out there in the middle of that field. It was pitch black out there. You could see every star in the sky. And I lifted my face up in the middle of that field. And I said, God, I can't get free. I can't get free. Lord, I'm sorry. I can't get free. Lord, I need your help. And tears are flowing down. I'm just a teenager crying out to God. And I can tell you this. It was just a habit I had in my life. I I didn't feel anything. I didn't hear anything. But I can tell you from that prayer, this has been been over 30 years ago. Some 35 years ago or so. And from the moment of that prayer, I have never had that issue ever, ever again in my life. Why? Because he sets captives free. You may be facing a mountain. It may be a personal struggle. It may be a family struggle. It may be a directional issue. But if you want God to meet with you and you just want to come and stand with us and sing this, we're just going to pray a prayer together here. And we love you. Let's sing this again. If you want to just come and pray, come and stand with me right here. Come on, right now. Humble yourself and just come.